be consumer healthcare and to extrapolate all of the amazing insight that she has and the information she has within her head, we've got none other than Jeffrey Nicholson, who is the CEO for Tracer. So without us, let's give our audience a wonderful round of applause in the virtual world. Jeff and Dana. Awesome. I uh, really appreciate you having us today. Uh, Dana and I are very excited to talk about, you know, making sense of a broken world. So if there's any questions out there, please fire away. Um, I think we're going to start with just a really quick kind of exercise around what does a broken world mean? And so Dana, we've talked about this a little bit. What are the big kind of pillars that you see in marketing, media, technology that are broken to you, right? I mean, the list is pretty long, isn't it? It, it is. It <laughs> is. I mean, is it the dominance of walled gardens? Is it organizational structures? Is it you know, my always favorite is the, uh, the lack of tenure for executives and, and how their decisions are being made. What, what's, the, what's the first one you'd love to discuss for, for everybody? Well, first of all, if you ask me if they're all there, yes, yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, uh, I think anyone who's ever heard me speak about walled gardens, right? I mean, walled gardens continue to be such a problem. Um, you know, I, I think in a world where everybody needs the transparency and everybody needs to know what they're doing and every dollar counts, uh, you know, we got, we, we got to figure out a way to break this down. And, and I think every time anyone has asked me this, they, you know, it, it, the tables kind of get turned around me and say, well, you're the client, you figure it out, right? Um, until um, stop playing the game, nothing's ever going to change. And, you know, what I would just say, Jeff, is, is that, you know, this is a call to action. Like we need as, as, you know, as the advertisers and the advertiser spend, ad, ad spenders, we need to start holding all of our um, partners accountable. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be no exceptions on that. Yep, I would agree. So let's start with that one, you know, the, the dominance of large scale platforms and businesses. And I think that actually transcends both traditional and digital media. So if you think about the, the digital media, which I think people attack probably mm -hmm. more often as a topic, you have Amazon, Facebook, and Google as the triopoly of, of dominance, right? When you start to think about, you know, every dollar going into digital, they're getting more than their fair share, some would say. Um, now, I, I could definitely argue that they produce results. I think one of the reasons people do come to those platforms is that they fundamentally work, right? If you look at intent signals on Google, you know, they are there to a transact. I mean, Google has become functionally a verb. However, I think when you start to look at the consolidation around those platforms, I think it does eliminate a lot of choices or variables that maybe people would test. And then in the traditional sense, you know, upfronts has classically been something that people have attacked around just the dominance of the classic networks and how that's kind of eroding based on OTT streaming services and the uh, honestly plethora of options that you now have in regards to how people digest content. So in, in, in your opinion, when you look at traditional versus digital, what do you think the biggest problems with those companies' dominance is? is it, do you think that the upfront and how they negotiate and kind of lock people into pricing over a 10 or 20 year period um, do you think it's that, you know, Google has such a large share of the digital kind of investment? Where do you, where do you fall in that regard? Well, I think, well, let me start with a couple of things. Um, one, I think commitments are a real issue, right? And I think, you know, um, I think if you asked almost any advertiser, they're going to tell you that they would like to go to a performance culture where um, everybody earns their money and that there's no upfront commitments. And I think, you know, the upfront has existed as long as it has for um, a variety of reasons. So, you know, whether you live within that constrained environment that you're, you're committing to your dollars upfront, how do you start to create flexibility in those spends? I think what is frustrating, particularly frustrating, is as new channels have emerged, more digital channels, the fact that they've moved to that model and want those upfront commitments is very frustrating as an advertiser. And so I think one of the biggest benefits, right, that anyone will tell you about digital is the fact that you can optimize it, the fact that it can be performance-based. And so the upfront commitment is just a complete disconnect from a performance-based culture. And so I think the more that we push back on those things and say that's not what we're looking for you know um you know you'll have the big um you know the big the big the triopoly you discuss bringing up things like well if you don't commit to us up front you don't get the service mm -hmm. 
I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, do they want the money? I mean, if you want the money, you got to service us, right? I mean, otherwise, we're going to have other choices. And I think that until we all realize we have choices, we're going to continue to be in this sort of perpetual cycle. Yep. And I think it's about pushing back and letting them know we have choices. And by the way, give some of those small guys um, um, a run for their money, because I will tell you, I mean, you will find that, you know, I mean, we, we are definitely using a multiple multi-DSP approach. And I will tell you the service and the hunger that some of the small guys have make up for um, a lot of, you know, what you see with the big guys. So I think until you really put them to the test, Jeff, yep. I mean, it's going to continue to be a situation where they're in control. And at the end of the day, I'm spending money for my business. I need to be in control of the outcomes. Absolutely. And do you think from a forcing factor, I'd be very curious to know this, and, and we've discussed this a little bit before, do you think the bigger forcing factor was the growth of digital versus traditional, right? We finally hit the point in the recent years mm -hmm. where it's a 50-50 split and traditional is not the dominant investment channel. Um, do you think it's the relationship with the agencies and how they aggregate spend and then push that as a relationship dynamic? Do you think that even COVID and the disruption of linear television and that there's not sports and how the upfronts were disrupted will create that change. What do you think is the biggest catalyst for change in regards to how that world works? I mean, I do think as, as, as more um, advertisers spend more in the digital world, yes, you are going to start to see that. But, you know, I mean, look, the reality of the situation is um, when you look at the television marketplace, demand continues. I mean, so demand continues to outpace supply. Yep. And so, and supply is at a decrease because people are watching less, yep. but the demand is still there. Right. And so it, I think even as dollars shift to digital, the control still remains with the networks. And I think that's what continues to make this a challenging world. I think, I think it is really, I mean, the ANA had done some work this year as well, trying to figure out how do we bring advertisers together to have one voice. I think until we come together as, a, as an industry to try to make these changes, it's not going to happen. One company alone can't do it. It's got to be a collective yeah, I would agree. to be able to start changing this. And things. you are seeing large scale brands. I mean, I think, you know, Mark Pritchett has been very vocal at, right. at P&G. I think you're seeing other brands definitely challenge the, the classic infrastructure in our space around how they purchase inventory. And I do think it's one of those things where it's almost a snowball downhill, right? Where you're going to build momentum. And as to your point, you get more advertisers. There will be a tipping point of maybe they will break the system finally. And there will be, I think, a new appreciation for how dollars are both spent and the value that needs to be returned. Right. Because the expectations, I think, should be higher. And I think that on the advertisers, I have a, a classic line I always love to use where no one's going to care about your money as much as you do. And therefore, you're going to be you know, responsible to challenge how that's being treated. Right. Everything from technology partners to, you know, classic advertisers to networks. Well, I mean, I think, Jeff, it starts with we as advertisers have to have visibility. That's right. Right. I mean, I mean, we're working with you now. I mean, um, and that relationship is completely because we know that we need transparency. Yep. I can't have a valid conversation around performance if I don't hold the information. I mean, yes, I have an agency partner and I expect my agency partners to fight hard on my behalf, but my agency partners have to fight. I mean, they're an organization in and of themselves, right? Yep. And while yes, they are there to, to um, deliver against my business, who's best um, able to negotiate based on my yep. business? I am. That's right. And so until I have the story and until I understand the numbers, the metrics, the data, I don't have a fighting chance. I have no leverage in the conversation. Yep. Absolutely. So I think that's, I mean, that to me, I mean, like that, that can't go unsaid as until advertisers also take control of the data and have a true appreciation for it. That doesn't mean cut the agency out. That means have, be at, be at a equal footing so mm -hmm. that you understand what you are trying to negotiate. Yep. And let's, let's hit on both of those topics. I think you hit on two good ones. One is procurement and how you have business relationships with your partners. And we'll leave that for the second. I think the other one is just understanding the dynamic nature of the relationships in the organizations. Even, you know, in your history, you've worked at some very large scale advertisers and brands, and most likely you're going to deal with multiple agency partners across media, technology, creative, et cetera. And I think one of the biggest struggles is who's playing for the advertiser's benefit, right? Who's stepping back and understanding in the value chain, even protection, other than yourself, it's very rare, right? And I think you know, I have, a, I have a lot of respect for Havas, your agency. I think they do a great job and are actually very progressive in the relationship with you. But it's difficult for everyone to navigate. There's classic architecture around procurement that dictates relationship dynamics. But I think the bigger point in regards to agency brand and platform is you have to find a relationship that works for you 
and that's going to continue to be flexible as the world changes. I mean, I think you can't highlight that enough. I mean, I think we have to ask and demand the relationship we want. I mean, you know, you talk about Havas, and, and I agree with you, Havas is a great partner, but I've also asked for what I want, and I've been yep. very clear with Havas that what success looks like for me, and success for me looks like having having the same information they have, right? Yep. And so, you know, we always talk about even large partnership, large-scale partnerships with the agency being a tri-legged stool, right? Yep. It's, it's, the, it's the platform, it's the agency, and it's us. And we're all at the table and we're all discussing, right? The agency brings a lot of benefit. I mean, I've been saying forever that, you know, the future of the agency model is, 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 is completely based on their flexibility mm -hmm. to, um, to, create a model that works for each bespoke client because you see varying degrees of, you know, I mean, I used to think the word in-house was kind of bad, but I mean, in-housing has a lot of different yeah. meanings. In-housing could mean, hey, I'm going to bring everything in-house. And in-housing could also mean, hey, I have a team of um, probably five or six people on my team, right? I wouldn't call this yeah, an in-house agency. They're a center of excellence. They're almost. a center of excellence. Yep. Exactly. So how do they work with us, right? And recognizing that we're there as a control tower internally. I mean, we're spending a lot of money. My marketers expect that that's what my team is doing. Mm -hmm. So I think the agencies that are gonna be successful in the future are the ones that are really willing to be flexible. But I also think advertisers shouldn't be afraid to say that they need a model that is bespoke to them. Correct. And it's no one size fits all anymore. Yeah, and I think a really good example, and I don't know how familiar you are with this, but if you think about S4, Right. Mm -hmm. Sir Martin Sorrell, obviously one of the best known executives in the space. He's responsible for, for fundamentally building WPP. Um, obviously, there was a conflict there and he left the business and he's launched a competitive offering. And his offering, he moved significantly away from the classic Cold & Co model. And he said, hey, we're going to teach companies to go in-house. Right. We're going to be more flexible in our, our procurement structure. And they're taking a very digital first a uh, flexible approach, which is combating directly against the holding companies. And I think one of the, the limitations on competing with the large scale holding was honestly the ability of infrastructure and money, which is not uh, a weakness in his regard. And they've quickly become, I think, one of the top 10 media companies on the planet, right? And, and probably under three years, right. you know, with a combination of media monks and mighty hive. And so would love your thoughts a little bit about, you know, how much does that represent, I think, where the world is going? I mean, I think, I think everyone needs to define what that means for them, right? What is your, I mean, you know, one of the things I will say is, is that, you know, I think, I'm, look, the reality of the situation is everyone's going to have some version of in-housing mm -hmm. in the future. I think, you know, we got to be open to redefining what that means. Yep. Um, for some, it'll be two or four people in-house, depending on their spend. For others, it'll be more than that. I think you need to figure out what your structure is and you need to see where the value is for you. What, what, what we can't forget as advertisers is what our core business is. Our core business, we're not advertising right. agencies. So I can't start bringing in, you know, 50 people and start taking headcounts away from marketing because that's mm -hmm. or research and yeah. development or any of those other areas where yeah. I need to make sure that we're driving innovation in our space. Um, I think we really need to define what is our core business um, and, and then build around it to say, what support do we need around really, frankly, the largest spend on any that's organization's right. P&L, yep. right? And how do we how do we ensure that that spend? Long gone are the days where you kind of set it and forget it, and you know you give it to the agency and you you hope and pray. I mean, there's measurement for everything now, that's and right. and as as internal um, folks, there's a lot of pressure on us to show the numbers. Yep. And so um, so what is it going to take in each organization to make sure that you have the right control to make sure that those numbers are going the way that you need them? Absolutely. To? So, I mean, I think, you know, Jeff- Well, and agencies are huge value, right? I mean, let's, yes. you know, first and foremost, I want to say, you know, I worked at VaynerMedia. I believe in the agency model. I think there's a, a huge benefit across the board, no matter if you're a large-scale Fortune 100 global company, all the way around to a D2C, anything from pioneering intelligence, infrastructure globally. Um, there's a variety of use cases that are very beneficial to the brand. So by no means do I think yes. that agencies are going away. But I do think the model needs to adjust and then people need to pick what works for them, right? As a small brand, you're probably going to lean on them more because you can't invest in every area of marketing and you have to deal with email and execution on digital right. and maybe television. And those are difficult things to navigate as a small brand. And as a large brand, you need something that probably has global infrastructure that you can re you know, rely on regionally and maybe need heavy level of creative production. So I think the, the value is definitely there. I think they need to match that with the procurement and the relationship dynamic that's going to move forward. Well, I think, you know, you've obviously got the operational needs that an agency brings. I mean, right, there's all that. But really, the agencies of the futures are the ones that are like 
really investing in that thought leadership and that strategic yep. partnership. I mean, look, I, I manage a team of people. The, the thing that keeps me up at night is how do they continue to have outside in thinking? Because at the end of the day, you hire these people. How do you ensure that they're still getting best in class yep. thinking? And that's where the agency is fundamental to those conversations. Look, they've got other clients. They, they, they're, they're thought leaders in the space. This is their job 24 seven. Whereas my job varies between managing a P and L managing, you know, um, advertising, thinking about people. I mean, there's a lot of things that I have to do that doesn't allow me to spend 24 seven doing and yep. learning media. So I think it's critically important that agencies recognize too, their value today is about strategic thought leadership. Absolutely. Switching topics a little bit. Yep. I, I think we, we kind of mentioned procurement a few times in, in that, that conversation. How do you feel like in this world, because I definitely think this is one of my biggest buckets of how um, we operate as a broken environment, procurement is hurting people. Well, I hope my procurement people yeah. aren't watching. Well, let's talk about your, your, <laughs> your past experiences. We love Sanofi procurement. But no, I mean, honestly, I mean, you've, you've had a wealth of experience right. in the industry. I think procurement, everything from internal to external, how people operate, how they even sign contracts, the tenure of them, what they yeah. dictate in relationship dynamics. You know, any initial thoughts on how that hurts our world and how it continues to per perpetuate like almost bad decision making, in my opinion? Well, I think anywhere in an organization where you see sort of support services and procurement falls within that category, right? Um, those are not places that are heavily um, um, funded from an FTE mm -hmm. and, a, and, and people standpoint. And so I think the challenge is media has become far more complex than it has ever been before. So I think the first challenge is how do you make sure your procurement partners are knowledgeable in the space that they are in charge of? So when you don't have a procurement partner who, yeah. partner who knows media, now all of a sudden that's a huge disadvantage because they're looking at media vendors and media partners as suppliers. Yeah. suppliers. And maybe even looking at an Excel sheet deciding exactly. on potentially just pricing or exactly. you know specific features and offerings but not understanding how they relate to the actual business operations. Exactly. Of the I mean I mean when you're you're talking about a pharmaceutical company, I mean think about who our suppliers are, other people who create bottle caps and bottles and pills and all those kind of things. You cannot apply that that methodology of procurement to media and expect that you're going to get what you need. I mean, what we're asking for a strategy, strategic partnership. That is not the same thing as how much can I like, mm -hmm. you know, take off each head because now my bottle is cheaper, right? And, and I can create greater margin. So I think procurement organizations that are successful are the ones that are hiring experts in fields. And, and sometimes that means they don't have the strong procurement background. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something that they have to invest in teaching yep. them. And those people are business partners. And truly that's when it changes yep. is when they can truly be business partners, be embedded in the business, understand the needs of the business, and then create a procurement strategy that delivers against the business goals as opposed to just it being an economical act Correct. exercise. Yeah, I really, I truly believe that people need to move away from balance sheet decision making right. um, and start to understand the intangibles around how that drives business growth and what you're really trying to achieve with procurement because that is, as you said, a service function to the business operations and decisions you need. It shouldn't be the driving criteria. Right. I think one of the things I've, I've still astonished with, and I think one of the biggest things in our world that's broken, is even how people choose partners. When you start to look at the evaluation process and some of the companies that even facilitate these decisions or help to facilitate, you, you run into a massive problem. I mean, I've actually filled them out personally where you start to fill out a, a cheat sheet, right, for the, the client's potential decision making, and they might even check you off the list just based on whether you qualify in three areas without right. even talking to you. Right. Now, I find that a, a little bit kind of naive when you need to dig a lot deeper before you're picking a partner of that scale and size, especially in multiple seven figure, you know, investments. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think, you know, long gone are the days where you fill out a form and everything is, I mean, even if you think about whether it be the agency partner or whether it be ad tech partners, the value proposition they have is all very unique because if it wasn't, they couldn't differentiate That's themselves right. from everybody else. And so how do you get value prop in a form letter? You can't, it's not a, it's not a, pull down, you yeah. know, like select your value prop, no. right? No. And so until you can, and, and I think that's the challenge too, is how do you as like in my role, how do I make sure I'm at the table with the discussion and it's not, I'm not leaving. I've got so much on my plate. 
sometimes it's easy to say this is procurement's job, right? Procurement's going to bring, you know, do the sort of the first round cuts and then they're going to bring me the partners that make sense. But if I'm not at the table having the conversation, there may be things that they're missing and they're not very close to the business. So it's, it's really about making sure too that the people who are in my roles are doing their job too to make sure that they're vetting people based on what we really need to get, get accomplished. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to throw a little curveball at you because okay. I've been thinking about this today. So what do you believe, I call um, template decision making in our industry one of the biggest problems, right? It, and, and I'm going to give you two examples and I'd love your thoughts on what do you think this really you know, hurts us and, and hurts people in the future? One of them is people take resumes and they decide on their past experience based on seeing that they worked for the NBA or they worked for Nike and they say, this person's great because someone else gave them credibility to give them a job. Right. They won't even validate what they deliver to that company. Don't understand, you know, Google's the classic one. Oh, you worked at Google, you're amazing. Now I love Google, but that doesn't mean you're a plus talent and you're gonna deliver for my business. Right. Maybe you were one of the 10 people on one feature and product on Google and had very little impact. So one de template decision making, which I truly hate, is accepting that someone's resume dictates they were good at that job or function and accepting that for yourself. Right. The other one, and we just discussed this, is just template decision making in regards to, well, this is how the industry works and I have to do this, as opposed to reevaluating re what works for your business. In that classic kind of definition of template decision making, what do you think the biggest broken world is? It is accepting other people's credibility without evaluating yourself. Is it accepting their past decisions and then replicating them? Or even worse, is it teaching bad behaviors to other people so that the generations of education continue to foster the same bad decisions? I mean, it's like technology can become our biggest enemy, right? So, I mean, if you think about, um, you know, I post a position. Um, I mean, the, the, the technology is gonna crawl all the resumes that come in, mm -hmm. they're gonna be looking for certain things. And you're absolutely right, like technology can be a hindrance to getting that superstar. Because if that superstar didn't have the right words on their resume or have the right sure. roles, they're never even gonna make it in the system to come to me, right? Yeah. And so I think, I think it's a huge issue because particularly in a world where all of a sudden the criteria of success are changing. I mean, like in the future, are we gonna require a college degree? I don't know that we're gonna require a college degree. I think degree. it's already, I mean, it's already gone in my opinion. I mean, if you look at Google, Amazon, and a variety of the large scale tech, they no longer require a college degree. Right, but, but there are still a lot of companies, yeah. Jeff, right, where you don't get past the, uh, the tech crawling, right? Yeah. Or even worse, people judge, you know, you went to, you know, state school versus Harvard and everyone picks Harvard. And, and I argue a lot of the time, I'm, I'm looking for pure ambition and hunger and maybe that's not there for the Harvard, and that's no disrespect either way, but I think people far too often are deciding on brand association that actually is not applicable to skill or talent. Right, and I mean, look, at the end of the day, we're not gonna say do away with process. Process is there for a reason, but I mean, you and I were in a conversation yesterday where we were talking to someone where um, there was a delay in hiring and bringing someone on because while they, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was vetted that they had a college degree, yep. they couldn't vet that they had a high school degree. Yep. Now, where does the common sense kind of get yep. thrown out the window that if they had a college degree, clearly they had a high school degree, right? Yep. But because they couldn't validate that they had a high, high school degree, it, the, the, you can't bring that person in and now it's creating business delays, right? Yeah. So I think it's really when that sort of, um, the more that we identify where this templating world is, is actually creating business issues, mm -hmm. that's when it's really going to get elevated, right? And I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to really challenge those things. No one is suggesting process doesn't matter. I just think we got to think a little more. Yeah. I mean, my favorite in, the, in this regard is the, um, requirements of experience right when they actually physically don't exist right okay, so my favorite is i need someone to be a senior executive who has omni-channel experience for 15 years and their definition of omni-channel experience is facebook amazon roku and linear television and that honestly functionally doesn't exist right because some of those companies didn't exist for 15 years in right. order for you to even practice that level of, right. of seniority and those things are so rampant in our industry. If you look at a majority of the companies at all levels, tech, brand, and agency, you will see a variety of job functions where people require something that actually physically doesn't exist in our world. Right. And so for me, I think, you know, my challenge to everybody is, is reevaluate how you're making decisions. Understand you need to think about what even exists from an experiential perspective in people's history. Uh, and why are you really pushing for these requirements? Because I think they need to match much more to what you're looking for, not what other people were looking for five years ago. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I'll flip, I'll flip that is, you know, when you're looking for someone who is a social lead, right? Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, at the end of the day, I want someone who's a super user. Yeah. I need someone who's using TikTok. I don't need someone whose child is using TikTok. I need someone who's using mm -hmm. TikTok, but I also need that person to be able to come into an organization and deal with senior leaders yeah. and explain why TikTok makes sense. So how do you sort of reconcile the fact that someone who is still using TikTok may have five years of experience in mm -hmm. the business? If they're a superstar and they can, they have the maturity to talk to senior leaderships, they shouldn't be disqualified. And in fact, I almost want them. I mean, I mean, one of the criteria is I need you to be a super user. Yep. Right? And I think ageism happens on both sides. I think right. people don't appreciate experience enough for people who have been in the space for 20 years and how that can be leveraged for the organization and vice versa. I think people disqualify young individuals to your point around, okay, well, I want a power user and a lot of people aren't. And so right. where do I go get that person regardless of their age? I want someone who really knows the game. Right. Right. And I think, I think that's important. Do you have, do you have TikTok by the way? You're on there? I do. All right. See, there we go. Uh, Dana, you know, very, very, very ahead of her game. I love that. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, that's going to be, lead me to one of my favorite topics is education, right? I think one of the biggest struggles in our industry is the lack of education and reinvestment in employees. Um, I think there's a lot of great programs out there, but I don't think everybody's nearly dedicated enough to educating um, all aspects of their organization in the realities of today's world, right? Are they doing certifications in, in new programs? Are they teaching people that they need to be power users on these platforms that they may not use as a consumer, but that's honestly their responsibility as an executive in our industry um, any thoughts on education and kind of where that sits in our, in our space? Well, I'm going to turn this one around you. Ooh, here we go. Yeah. I know you, you, you make a great investment in education, right? I, I mean, that's one of the things you and I talk about all the mm -hmm. time is how much time you focus on education, right? I mean, you're a CEO of an organization and, in, and it's not like you have an abundance of time, but you have made that one of your missions. Mm -hmm. you, I'm going to turn this question around. Yeah. You talk to me about yeah. why you think education is so important. I always tell people, you know, there's, there's two aspects for me. One, um, when you're discussing your team and, and even external team and the people that surround your business, that is your family, right? And we both have children and I spend more time with a lot of the people on my team and my partners um, than I do with my family. And so you have to understand that that is a heavy investment. And so the first thing I, I try to remind myself every day is that it's my responsibility to invest in all aspects of how I add to my family. And that means time. Um, a lot of the time when you look at large scale executives, they will not get to the entry level positions or pay any attention to how people inject into their family. And I think that's a huge weakness for organizations because you can have exponential value return uh, on young, talented, hungry um, employees because you just need to continue to invest in them and, and reward them for being there and, and make sure that you're pushing for education improvement. I think the other piece is that challenging uh, yourself to not know the answers, right? I, I, I tell myself all the time, I'm like, Jeff, you're super dumb, go learn more, right? And I think that that's everything from, I didn't grow up in the television world. I grew up, you know, I'm 37 years old and I had the luxury of, of running ads on Google very early. So my obviously experience is much more in the digital space. So I spend a lot more time learning in, in other channels that I wasn't classically, you know, um, lucky enough to experience in my career. I don't think people are pushing on either side. I think people need to double down and in reinvesting in, in who they hire because it is more expensive to go find someone new than teach someone that they, that you love them and they should be better in your organization. And then, um, I also don't think people are challenging themselves to get better. I think people are templatized in their education process. They are not bringing external, you know, kind of sources in, um, and really need to reevaluate how they're they're growing their organization internally as a nucleus. I mean, I think that I mean, you know, you hit on something important, which is people recognizing what their blind spots are. Um, let me let me tell you. I mean, when I'm looking for um, leadership from a partner standpoint, the one thing I'm always looking for is someone who sort of understands everything. I, I don't want to have to go to my digital lead and then my TV lead. I want someone who's looking at things very um, holistically. So, I mean, I think, I think part of it is recognizing your blind spots. I also think the agency world today, people, I mean, there's such a back to our conversation around procurement, right? That um, people are doing jobs that two people were doing yep. 15 years ago, which leaves a whole lot less time for education. So how do you make sure that you're continuing to push yourself? I mean, I, I do it all the time. I mean, you mentioned that, I mean, I've got two young kids and I've got a full-time job, but I spend a lot of time trying to make sure that I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm out there meeting people, talking to people and getting my opinions challenged because I'm never going to be 
don't keep keep getting challenged. Yeah, I mean, I I always have a classic rule where it's the 80-20, 20% 20 of your half, at minimum has to be something that you don't understand that's challenging you to learn every day. And you can't just sit there, you know, milking yourself from the things you already know, right? You need to continue to invest and double down. So um, I think education is one of the biggest things in our, our, our world that needs to be changed. And, and I, again, I challenge everybody who, who potentially listens to this and is live now, make sure that you're doing this at your organization and not just for yourself, but for future generations, you're helping their careers grow. I think one of the nicest things, and I love this when we talk about it a lot, is that watching other people grow and prosper in their career based on you investing in them is one of the most rewarding things you can have Absolutely. probably as a, as a human being. Absolutely. Oh, we have a question from the crowd here. So, and it's for Dana. I will read this. What role does you and your team play in helping to lead positive change in culture for your organization, especially with how much change in your team is visible to? Um, I mean, significant, right? I mean, we, we have a lot of classic marketers. We have, um, you know, I mean, you, you, we have to create a culture in the, well, I mean, I'm in a, I'm in a unique position. Our organization sort of came together a year ago. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of organizations, you come in, there's already an existing culture. And you know, when you come into a role like mine, you have to figure out what you can what your what you can do in the short term, what mm -hmm. you can do in the long term, how much you can change and push that culture and develop a culture that's either based on performance or based on, you know, measurement, whatever you have you, you know. Um, I came into a unique position and this is what was super exciting about the role at Santa Fe. I was coming to an organization where I was just going to get to create it. Yeah. Right. And so I, when I came into the organization, you know, I not only had to establish my team as the experts, the ones that were sort of setting the stage when it came to investment in media. Um, but also, I mean, I have to, I can't just set the stage. My team has to perform. Yeah. And so I think, you know, a lot of the visibility comes from really you know, practicing what you preach, right? Like, so it's not good enough to say, and this goes back, I mean, gosh, we're going to go full circle to our conversation about wall gardens where we yep. started, right? If I say we're a performance driven organization, I have to also make tough mm -hmm. choices. Yep. I have to be able to say to marketers, don't get too hung up on falling in love with one platform because we need to be able to have the leverage to say to those platforms, if you're not going to live in, like nobody gets to grade their own homework. No, you know, I mean, if you're not willing to work with third party measurement, if you're not willing to allow us to understand the data, then we can't continue to invest in you blindly. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that comes from really setting those rules up front, but then living into them. I mean, the worst thing I can do is go into a conversation with one of these big guys and just say, oh, well, we said no one can grade their own homework, but then, you know, it yeah. was Google and it was Facebook. And so we relented because we're not going to walk away from yeah. them. Now we're not stupid. I mean, we don't, we recognize yeah. these are partners that are important to our organization, important to us and important to you said it, important to our success. There's proven success. It's really just about making sure that we continue to actually live, you know, walk Live the your walk. truth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's, that's, that's important. I mean, it, you can't accept past conventions, you need to continue to challenge no matter how big or small, right. right? And I think obviously you have to understand where you sit in the size spectrum and, and obviously the power dynamic, but that doesn't mean you should continue to challenge everything from education all the way to procurement. Right, and, and I think as you do it, look, I, I keep saying this, media has gotten more complicated your marketers are relying on you. you. If you can be the leader, they're going to follow your lead. If I say, hey, we need to pull off of Facebook for the week of the elections, they're not going to challenge me on that because I wouldn't say that lightly. And so mm -hmm. I think it's about really establishing that and because they're yearning for leadership. It's, it's complicated. No one yeah. knows what the right thing to do 100%. is. 100%. I mean, I also, I use a, a classic example in regards to what you just said of, of media's kind of honestly just explosion in regards to how many choices are on the consumer. I mean, if you think about classic television had three channels, then you move to cable, then you move to the debundling of OTT and you start to look at Disney Plus's success and how people are going to re kind of engage as a consumer in that space all the way to, you know, TikTok, Snapchat, et cetera. And the second wave of kind of evolution of, of social media, I think there's just a lot more things that people need to be aware of. And, and you both have to be empathetic to that, but also just be up for the challenge. Yeah. Because, you know, I ran ads many years in my life and in a closet with my best friend, Addie. And we used to always joke that now it's, it's severely more complicated. I mean, I had to be really good at Google, Yahoo and Bing and maybe Ask Jeeves and a few other earlier ones. But now, I mean, if you're a cheeseburger shop, for example, 20 years ago, you had to be good at making cheeseburgers. Right. And maybe good at saying thank you and customer service at the front door. Right. And now they need to be great at Google listings yes. and, and Yelp 
and have great, you know, service with DoorDash and Uber yes, Eats. And yes. I think the problems for every business just exponentially grew. And I think that's why people need to be better around procurement, better around relationship dynamics and make sure they're adding value across the board. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Jeremy, any other questions? I want to make sure that, you know, we're running out of time here. We're, we're nearly six minutes away. And as you said, we, we were going to talk for quite a while. So uh, anything that you'd want to highlight, Jeremy? Yeah, absolutely. The, fortunately, we've got a few more questions from the audience, but they've put them into the Q&A panel, but that's okay. But before, before I ask any of those, I just want to say, absolutely, you can, you can also see the chemistry between the two of you and how you work. <laughs> yeah. I think we do hang out a decent amount, so. Yeah, but what's, what's very interesting is the direct questions you ask. I mean, it's very refreshing to hear and to see is actual direct questions being asked of, of a client and, and the client not being embarrassed, not being scared to say stuff. I mean, I've, I've got about 20 questions in my head, but that's not fair. So I'm going to go to oh, a couple oh, of questions. Hand, by the way. <laughs> don't, be, don't be asking me questions that embarrass me, Jeremy. <laughs> I won't, I won't. Don't worry about that. I've, I've, vetted, I've vetted them all, which is, which is really interesting. And, and actually, you know, like a, like a good journalist I was many years ago, I'm just segueing this beautifully in. Someone has asked, can you talk more about uh, making a success out of how you two work together? Yeah, I think um, I want to start with this one because it's important yeah. to me. So I think one of the things, Tracer's invite only. So I think one of the early things that we pride ourselves on is having mutual respect for the partnership. Um, my CTO is, is my business partner. He's one of my best friends and, and he runs engineering and, and we're, we're an engineering company. And I have more respect for their time than they could ever imagine. I'm happy to waste my own time, but I will never waste my team's time. So I think early on setting the tone on transparency around communicating that to our potential partners where you're not going to mow me over, right? We're here to add value together and I'm not going to accept past conventions. I think a lot of the time you, people use the word vendor uh, and not partner. And I really hate that because I don't want to be mistreated and I definitely don't want my team to be mistreated. So I think early on, having open communication and transparency was very important to me. And when I met Dana, we had that mutual respect where, okay, we're going to do this together and you understand where I'm coming from and I understand where you're coming from. So I think the first and foremost on that is, is setting that tone early and then actually having your procurement conversations match that. Taking mutual risks together and saying, okay, great, I'm, I'm willing to come in and prove myself and your organization and then we can grow together as opposed to I think a lot of people try to put poison pills um, and how they match their business operations to what they're trying to achieve. And so I think for me, that was, that was really big. And I think, you know, on our end, I mean, Jeremy, you know, I, I, I agree, Jeff, we, we don't say vendor in our organization either because you become a partner when you treat people like partners, mm -hmm. right? And that's when you start to get them invested in your business. Look, at the end of the day, Jeff needs to make money and, you know, yeah, um, just a little bit, but, uh, right. But at the end of the day, he's going to care about my business when I let him in and when he feels my passion for my business. Yep. And so he's only going to feel that passion if I bring him in. And so I look at a lot of our partners as extensions to my team, you know, and so how do I treat them as team members, as opposed to someone who's kind of, uh, you know, a hand, a hand um, you know, 10 feet away and is allowed only in to certain conversations, mm -hmm. right? Um, we actually have a whole partner framework we create where we sort of set the expectations early of what we define partnership is. And partnership is you win when we win and we win when you sure. win, right? Like there's, I mean, if, if I can win, there's more money to be had, right? So you should be invested in my success. Right. Um, and, and I will continue to share the wealth, right? But I think it really starts with really treating people like partners, understanding what partnership means, defining partnership in your organization, and then really treating them as an extension of your team. I, I love that. And it's very clear from today's conversation that that's, that's what you do. And again, just the candid nature is, is wonderful. Now, you, you both touched on education, which was fantastic. And you touched upon people understanding new technology, understanding the shiny new objects. Someone's asked a, a question around that. And it's, it's actually a very good question. It says, with so many feeder lines to the shiny objects in, me, in the media landscape, how do you filter for those areas of innovation worthy of investment to stay ahead of the competition. I mean, I think you got to get behind the shiny object, right? Behind the shiny object is an insight. Behind, it was created for a reason, right? There's a reason why a shiny object is shiny and it may not be shiny tomorrow. So you got to figure out why it exists today and if that, and figure out if that technology is actually meeting the need. It may only meet the need in a short term, but you've got to really get behind them. I and I tell people all the time, 
always start with the insight behind it. Mm -hmm. Like why did, why is this successful today? And is this a model that's going to continue to be successful or is it just a short term fix? And so I think if you can continue to do that, and by the way, use the shiny objects to understand what's changing. Yeah, I think that's the biggest one. I always say you got to rub nickels, right? Like with your own two hands. So I think the biggest challenge I always tell people around signing, go play. Yeah. Right. There's so many executives who have never run or built a campaign on Power Editor, yet they spend millions of dollars on Facebook. Right. So I think one of the biggest things I tell people is you got to practice yourself. You can't take anybody's you know word for it. Like be be um, open and challenge yourself to learning new things at a very direct level. And then I think the other piece is just making sure that you have an organization that is self-aware. Um, understand who you are, what you need to learn, and what's going to drive impact on your business. If you think about, you know, my favorite example is the, the new frontier is the home. You know, you think about security cameras, ring doorbell, um, you know, microwaves talking to you, IoT connections across all of your devices. Those things will completely change consumer behavior, right? The Amazon cart rule is one of my favorites. People who now reorder on Amazon or whatever service that they would like, it is going to be 10 times harder to conquest them on a certain brand dynamic. So if you're a gum brand and you're Dentine or Juicy Fruit, which is my old school favorite, well, are you going to be able to switch someone if they're reordering on Amazon and hitting every two weeks, reorder, reorder on their 25 items? I mean, it's going to get really hard to get new consideration on that when they're not in the store. There is no aisle where you look down and there's 50 things of gum. That has now been replaced in a digital storefront. What are you doing to have new conversations with consumers so they might actually buy juicy fruit again? And I think people need to really evaluate that um, and be self-aware on both where they are now, who they are, and where the world is going, and then challenge themselves to get better and in front of that. I, th I think that's a, that's a great answer. And that, that brings me, I actually had a question, uh, Dana, on something that you had mentioned earlier about what keeps you up at night and the, trying to ensure that your team is ahead of the game. I mean, that... How, you know, how, how do you do that? I mean, how do, how do you short? Because there's so many, so many things are happening. We're working at such a fast pace. You almost kind of want to stop. So you then give yourself, I don't know, half an hour, an hour to think of new things and new ideas. How, how, do, you, how do you do that? You bring in partners like Tracer. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, I, I mean, this is not a plug for you, but no, it is a plug for you. Appreciate it. Um, um, I mean, you have to, right? Like you have to continue to challenge yourself, take the meetings, take the meetings. I mean, look, we're all crazy busy um, and you can't take every meeting, right? I mean, I, I really can't. But when someone is really interested in meeting with you, figure out a way to meet because you don't know what nugget of information you're going to get from that. And again, like, you know, like we just talked about the shiny objects, read those headlines, Think about like, why is TikTok successful, right? Like, what is it about TikTok? TikTok may exist five years from now, maybe it doesn't, but there's a reason it exists today. So okay. I, think, I think read those headlines, really challenge yourself to understand the why behind and take the meetings. Yeah. Really do take the meetings. Yeah, and I go back again, rubbing nickels. If you challenge yourself to do your own research, I mean, even yesterday I sat and did query analysis on some of the major platforms for uh, a brand that, that uh, a fellow kind of coworker brought up and I showed them five simple examples on how the brand was not executing effectively. And this is simple as not having their PLAs, their product listing ads, where two of their competitors are eating their traffic. The main two units that someone sees, even on a branded search, were not owned by the brand. And this is one of the fastest growing CPGs in their category. And so you, you're paying millions of dollars in advertising. You're likely paying another agency millions of dollars in fees and yet, if you look at one of the five placements for this company, they're failing epically. And so I would even challenge every CEO out there to say, okay, what's important to my business? Am I being a consumer first and going into the world and understanding how other consumers experience my company? And I don't care if you're professional services, data processing like myself, or you're selling cookies, like you need to understand how people are going to come to you and that experience and make sure that it's as frictionless as possible. And remember, sometimes people see things about your organization before you do. He spends his time <laughs> thinking about how he can service companies like That's mine right. and how he can progress them. If I hadn't taken that meeting, you know, I mean, we'd be behind right now. And I think, you know, it is really critically important when someone sees a vision for you, be open to seeing what that vision is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one, I know we're almost right over, but one final question, which has come from our audience, uh, which actually is a really interesting one, considering all of the points you've touched on and talked about 
you know, people see these in particular about whether they have something on there that gives them a bit of sparkle. What do they need? Do you take someone with experience, someone who's young? Is it mean you've just got bland middle people? Not that all middle people are bland. I'm just, you know, front now there. What one piece of advice would you both give to someone starting out in the industry? Ooh, I, I got a few. Um, one, make sure that you're taking advantage of all the free information online. I am floored by how many people do not read help sections on the major, major platforms, do not actually go into the tools and pretend to launch campaigns, and do not go through conversion funnels of the industry that they're in. So first and foremost, take advantage of all of the information um, that's available to you that's free, because that will separate you. And then two, um, evaluate where your skills are now and where you want to be, and then find people who can add value to you. Um, so the second one is doing research on LinkedIn, for example, and finding who the three experts in your geo that are open to having a conversation who do want to talk to you and do pride themselves on helping and educating other people and go spend time with them. Um, because it's, it's the biggest two things you can do. Take all the information out there and then find people who want to add value to you as a person. I mean, I, I mean, to build on you, that are yours, that was kind of where I was going to is, you know, there are so many organizations for people who are starting out in the business, whether it's like local ad organizations, things like that, join those organizations and, and use them as an opportunity to network. You'll quickly be able to spot those people that are willing to kind of take a chance on someone young and kind of bring them along. Find those people and don't be afraid to ask for the help. Yeah, actually I, mean, I have a third too, which I think we talk about a lot is, is find a manager who's yes. going to really care about your career and make sure that they express that during the experience that you go through as an interview process and that organization and that manager care about you as a person and how you grow, not just what you produce for the company. I'm going to add one more before there you cut go. us off. Articulate what you want. Your yeah. manager can't do anything That's for right. you if you can't articulate what you want. Yeah. There are a lot of managers out there that are more than helpful, willing to help people, but when they can't articulate what, you, what they want, it's very hard for the manager to do anything for them. That's a great one. Like, look, absolutely fantastic. And I have to say, what a, what a wonderful conversation that was. Again, the candidness was, was very, very refreshing for the industry in particular. Um, I would say thank you very much to Dana and Jeff. Let's give them a round of applause in the virtual world. And I will also say thank you to everyone that tuned in. And also, I know there was a bunch of people that registered, dropped in, dropped out. I will implore you to get the video link. We'll have it up and ready to roll on Monday. And anyone who is tuned in still, you can take that link and pass it on to your team members. Because I think there's some real nuggets in here and some great content that you can take away and actually learn from. So Dana and Jeff, thank you so much. Thank and, you. Uh, and there we go. We got some comments already in there. Very refreshing, see, that's good. That's what we like. That's what we Love like. That. Love um, that. Special thank thanks you so much for making Thanks. Festival Friday so wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Dana and Jeff. Let's give them a round of applause one last time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you soon, everybody. Bye-bye.